This story will cover from then to now and next, all about change, how to turn losers into winners. Coming up on tonight's ITV News at 10, the most endangered birds in the world, and why a small flock here could be the saviours of the species. Fewer than 200 spoon-billed sandpipers are thought to be left in the world. I was just overwhelmed by the extraordinary story, really. It's sort of James Bond of the bird world. This is one of the most endangered species in the world. These are spoon-billed sandpipers. And to get here, conservationists have brought them on an incredible journey from the far east of Russia. So let's just take a little bit of a look at that journey. It was a phenomenal task and something that we would normally spend months preparing for, but we didn't have the luxury of time. We had to basically get out to Russia as quickly as possible. Probably the hardest bit was before leaving with your family and sort of dawns on you that you know, you're not going to see them for a while. <laughs> This expedition is one of the most ambitious and challenging expeditions that I know that's ever been undertaken to save a species. Having worked on waders for the last 40 years, this is the biggest conservation issue I've ever been involved in. It's the most exciting thing I've seen in my life. <laughs> I've never been anywhere in my life like this. Spoonbilled sandpiper is a really quirky and enigmatic little bird. I'm already a big fan of, of Arctic waders anyway, but the beak just sets it off. It's the only bird that hatches without the real long thin bill. It's just got this flattened little spoon as a chick, and the bill actually grows behind the spoon. It has a, a, a bright russet red head and chest and produces the most amazing call. It's also one of the rarest and most threatened animals on the planet. The only place this species breeds is in far northeastern Russia, in remote Chukotka and Kamchatka. And this is Arctic tundra, one of the most remote places on Earth. It arrives there after the ice and the snow has melted, tries to breed as rapidly as it can before it starts an 8,000 kilometre migration. The Spoonbill Sandpiper is the rarest of a group of species that migrate down the East Asian Australasian flyway. The East Asian Australasian Flyway is a flyway that holds some 50 million birds that breed up in the Russian Arctic and migrate 8,000 kilometres down to winter in Southeast Asia. Those intertidal wetlands are incredibly important, not just for the spoonbilled sandpiper, but for the millions of other migratory water birds that refuel there. The very rapid rates of economic developments in North Korea, South Korea, China, all of these countries, mean that those intertidal wetlands are being lost. They're being drained and used for agriculture, industry, tourism, things like golf courses, a whole range of things. So these critical sites are being lost very, very rapidly. People working on spoonbilled sandpipers in the Russian Far East had been doing surveys of the numbers of breeding pairs, which showed that uh, places where spoonbill sandpipers used to breed no longer had any breeding pairs. And overall, their surveys, taken over a period of at least 10 years, showed that the average rate of decline was about 25%, about a quarter 
less every year that went by. That's when we and other conservation organisations got together and decided to look at the option of conservation breeding to provide that vital safety net that could stop the species from going extinct. With these figures that had been obtained from these ring birds in the Russian Far East in this study, we were able to make a simulation model of the population to say, OK, suppose we wanted to establish a captive population of spoon-billed sandpipers who can be bred and their young eventually released back into the wild. What would be the potential negative effect of taking the eggs away from the wild population? And the results of that modelling were really important because they showed that the impact on the wild population would be negligible. And this is because the death rates of the young birds that migrate are so high, practically none of them survive anyway. So we were able to satisfy ourselves that this small number of eggs that we were convinced would be adequate for establishing a captive population could actually be taken without doing any appreciable harm at all. By the end of spring 2010, WWT and other conservation organisations realised that we had to do something really quickly, that this species could well be extinct within the near future, sort of five to ten years, unless something was done. I was confident that if we could find nests, that we could collect the eggs successfully, incubate and hatch those eggs. The question was, would we find any nests? Knowing that the species was declining at such a terrific rate, there was a real possibility that we wouldn't find any nests. Oh, Nigel, we are in Anadir. Dog tired. There's not a lot uh, going on. We've we've waited for our cargo to arrive yesterday. It didn't show up. It didn't show up the day before, and um, we're now being told that it will arrive. Hopefully, will arrive next Tuesday. So uh, we're it's Friday today, and um, we're crossing our fingers. We just want to sort of move on to the next next leg of the journey. Really get to mine the mine the Pilgana and uh, get all our equipment ready for, for the expedition. What have you seen then, Jochen? Oh, the Western Sand Pinaras came about 30 centimetres. Really? 30 centimetres. The team came together very quickly, you know, it was only a couple of months to really get everybody together. It was um, various people from around the world, lots of experience. And on arrival, uh, we could go to a small bar and hotel, sit down together, and Nigel and I could then start tapping into all this experience of arctic uh, wader nest finding. What about the place where we take the birds to another deer in July? They'll go possibly tomorrow evening there. The birds rush team are critical to the expedition, specifically to um, sort of pave the way, logistics, sort everything out for us and make sure we could get to where we were going. We travelled out there with two very experienced field workers and the Birds Russia team were supported by two volunteers for the expedition as well. Well we're all very pleased today, the uh, cargo has arrived, all our equipment has turned up from the UK. Um, we're going to go to a warehouse at three o'clock and sort out the equipment so part of it will be taken uh, with us to, to Minor when we eventually get there and the rest of it will stay here ready for our uh, return to Anadir in July. This is going to be where we uh, rear the babies once they hatch. Incubation room, 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 bed. We'll have to clean it up first though. So this is the uh, brooder units for the chicks to go in. We're setting them up now on the 25th of uh, May and uh, hopefully when we come back in July we'll be able to put chicks straight into these.
see that mountain over there? Yep. It means that today we're going, because today you can see the mountain. So at last, we're on our way. Away. Flight brought home how vast the area is. You, know, you can just see in every direction it's just open wilderness. Obviously, this, a lot of the snow will melt off, the ice will disappear, and once that happens, the tundra becomes, you know, becomes alive. And there's so much food, a super abundance of food available too. So you can see why it's so attractive to so many different species of, uh, of bird. Yes, everything's arrived. I've studied here. No fog, notice. After 12 days travelling, or waiting to travel to get here, we are here. The orange chair is, is, is brilliant, very good in what he does, and uh, instills a lot of confidence in uh, anybody that works with him will, will know that. If you're, you know, especially in difficult conditions, he, he always, uh, you're always backing to you know, do the biz, which um, Gives you a lot of confidence, you know, so you think all I've got to do is just support him and make sure um, everything falls into place. Well, that's us in Minor Pigla for the next, let's see, six, seven weeks now. We finally got here. Start looking for some real sample, please. We knew that we had to get to the breeding grounds ahead of the birds. Traditionally, the first springbill sandpipers are seen and heard around the 3rd of June. We managed to get there in late May. And what we, we, we did in the days before the birds arrived was set up our equipment, but also went out every day looking for early arrivals. The real challenge was the, the area where the birds lived, it being so inhospitable really. Uh, we know that it's a, a huge area. We knew that we had a lot of legwork ahead of us. We were going to have to cover a lot of ground very quickly in order to find those females and to collect any eggs before predators found them or even before they hatched. What are you doing again? Swimming! The western part of the speed for Later today we will tell you the results. And you expect to find how many? Well, we go for two pairs. Maybe more. Our Russian colleagues have been visiting Minor Piglano and the area where Spoonbill Sandpipers nest for a decade or more. So we knew roughly where the birds were and we knew what kind of habitat they favoured to make the nest to lay their eggs. We basically just had to get out there and walk and walk and walk and hope for the best. For a long time we were just looking for roughly where the birds were, listening for singing males at the beginning, then females with those males and then marching very widely around the area in the hope that we might see a bird when he or she was off the nest so that we could watch it back to the nest. So we've just had a long walk to an old site and seen nothing at all. Every day we'd go out searching for birds and we used to draw blanks day after day which was a little bit disheartening 
The research that's been done has shown that for every 100 adult breeding spoon sandpipers, about 76 of them survive from one year to the next. So for that population to be stable, you need to have 24 new birds coming back into the breeding population every year. And we know that of the spoon sandpipers that fledge and go to their wintering grounds, we only get five recruited back into the breeding population each year. The best technique for finding a spoon board sandpiper is a little bit of luck really. <laughs> it's such a big area, um, they're such small birds, you can hear the calls, that's the best way of locating pretty much any wader. If you can hear the calls then you know, they give themselves up, but when it's blowing, uh, wind's blowing very strongly then it's, uh, it's really difficult to, to see them. Martin McGill is a fantastic field ornithologist, second to none. He uh, he is what I would call a legger. He can cover the landscape very quickly, and it means that if he can walk to a place, he gets a sense of what should be there, and sure enough, it will be there. So it was it was fantastic to be out in the field with Martin. I felt that if there were any birds to be found, you'd find them. Being um, with and among spoonbill sandpipers, I mean, I, I love birds anyway, but um, that is one special bird, and just to be with it and you know, feet away from it at times, just hearing it, seeing them go about their daily, daily business was just, you know, that was pretty good. The first male that arrives, we think, it's, it's actually found itself a mate today. Flying around together, the males display, and going around checking out the site. We um, managed to spot the birds roosting on a bank and we've outflanked them and basically crawled on our bellies to get up nice and close. That was just a late morning. Uh, seeing a pair of spoon wheel sandpipers feeding on the ridge. How are you doing? Are you okay? Had a good day? Huh? Four? Yeah. Pairs? No, just birds. They were quite far one from another. So we think these are birds from different territories. That's very good news. Simon and I have just sat down listen for birds. We've been sat here about three minutes and we've just heard a male spoonbill sandpiper singing. It wasn't a long song. We know this bird probably has a mate so he's not really singing like he's advertising for a, a female. Just reaffirming that he's got one. There's a lot of bird song now but that distant shiree 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 call or song was a spoonbill sandpiper. Six or seven hundred meters away behind me. There's a male bird, probably with a female, just defending her and the territory where she's going to make a nest. They're likely to nest on these moraine hills that are covered with a very short moss and a lot of lichen. Quite barren to look at, but actually, 
across a lot of different species of flora. The Spoonbill Sandpiper has actually now just come down to this wet piece of ground behind me. It's moved over to the right and I'm now going to go and try and creep up upon it with Simon. We know that the birds have bred here in previous years. I'm going to see if we can see the female with the male. Perhaps the male will begin to nest scrape and we shall see. We found a male, but he wasn't uh, on the territory we hoped for. That means uh, a place where maybe he had a female where he was nest scraping. What happened was he, he disappeared and then we located him with his female next to a nice floor. He was stood on a mound, calling, watching us, watching him. And then eventually we picked her up. We saw her feeding, she gobbled down what looked like a large flat worm. Then they eventually joined each other and flew off. So all together, a good day, we've got a pair. What we've got to do is leave them to it for a little while. Hopefully he will make a nest scrape for her or a few nest scrapes for her to, to choose from. Then she'll get down to egg laying. Once she's laid some eggs, she begins incubation with him helping all the, all the time. And uh, when the eggs are maybe two and a half weeks incubated, we'll collect them. So it's lunchtime at the incubation centre and Martin is a vegetarian and every day has to prepare his own food. I don't know what he's got, water, a little bit of stuffed cube, some olives and what's that? It's uh, soft cheese on bread and butter and I've put a little sprinkling of chilli powder and I did a little bit of mixed herbs. And what have I got? I've got a fat sandwich. <laughs> it's now day 15. We've found a total of 16 birds, seven pairs in all. We think that birds are actually building nests or making nests now, and we'll be laying eggs one a day for the next week or so. We'll begin nest searching in a week or so's time, and hopefully begin collecting the week after next. So we've got Simon here cleaning the incubation room floor with a disinfectant solution. It's very important that the eggs are incubated in as hygienic conditions as possible. So we keep this room as clean as we possibly can. We've cleaned it with soap and water and we're now cleaning it, cleaning it again for I think the tenth time with a disinfectant solution that keeps out harmful bacteria, fungal spores, things that might damage eggs. So, disinfection complete. Yep, we're now ready to, uh, we're going to clean the incubators where the eggs are going to go. And um, we'll be ready to receive eggs. Right, we've just been looking for nests. We've been unsuccessful, we've walked about 12 miles. Saw one male on territory, probably with a female, but we couldn't find her. Let's see, shall we? It's actually very difficult to find Spoonbill Sandpiper or any shorebird nest. It really is literally a needle in a haystack. These eggs are, are tiny, the size of your thumbnail. Four eggs in a nest, often covered with very dense vegetation. You have to find birds and then watch the birds going to the nests. They come off once a day to feed males and females incubators so they exchange incubation duty. That's how you find nests. There were a few occasions when we were lucky enough to, to just be in the right place at the right time and we flushed the bird, we would back off and then watch the bird go back to the nest. And we found three nests that way.
how did you know there might be a nest here? I lie on the grass and looking for birds. It's fly Fl flew away and after maybe one minute come back sitting on the grass and go into the nest. Because uh, when uh, hatching is near, birds very quick come back to the nest. Hi right, fellas, you alright? How you doing, alright? See anything? Yeah, down out on the marsh. And? Gone. No, you tell the story. No. Been up to. You haven't found a nest, have you? We was walking along, bird come up, Martin picked it up. There, there it goes. As it went up in the air, Peregrine went over, and we was like, no, it's Peregrine. And then uh, it came back down, done a bit of a display, dropped, started feeding a little bit, didn't it? And then Martin mm -hmm. Peake was watching it. The uh, Spoonville Sandpiper has flown over calling and has landed, and uh, we, We've um, watched it walking through the grass, backwards and forwards. It's uh, passed the same area a few times, which has alerted suspicion that it's definitely got a nest there. Martin's getting close and looking at it, and I'm trying to scope it and find it in the grass, and I'm following it and losing it. And then it's just rear end went up. And I'm saying to Martin, I've got a nest, and Martin's already clocked that he's, he's watching it from a different angle. It's a bird on a nest. Um, Simon's onto the bird as well, he's watching it from the squirrel mound, he's got it in the scope. I've picked it up from where I've crawled to and uh, it's just sit, sitting tightly on its, on its nest. What a wonderful sight. Spoonbilled sandpiper on the nest, absolutely amazing. Absolute privilege to see this. You have no idea how I felt when I saw that rear end go up. Brilliant. Nice Great one, Mark. Yeah. Good in the net. And it was a proper nice moment. I bet it was. Just about every household in Chicotica has a large dog and those dogs are an early warning system for approaching bears. Normally, they're to be found in the hills, but every late springtime, they come to the lowlands where we were to catch spawning salmon. So we knew as every day went by, there was a greater chance that we would encounter a brown bear. Now brown bears not only eat spoonbill sandpipers, but we knew that they could be a risk to us. So we armed ourselves with some pepper spray, and uh, we had ATVs, which meant that we could make a quick getaway if we ever stumbled on a bear, or if a bear ever stumbled on us. Generally, the, the usual reaction for a, a, a brain bear is, as soon as it uh, realises that you're a human, it will run away. But the um, um, first encounter with a bear, it, it didn't do that. He's sniffing us out, Sorry. Si. It all came about, we were, Distracted by an Arctic order and uh, kind of forgot about you know the usual technique of just keep scanning the horizon. He's locked onto us. We made sure that he could smell us, and then we started. You know, it kept coming. We made then we made lots of noise. And it just kept coming. And whatever we did, it just kept coming. Just look behind us a minute, Si, will you? So, what happened next? Watch part two to find out.